everything. I'm just going to explain a little bit about what the Leaders Award competition is. If you're an engineer, what would you do? Um, so its main aim is to inspire young people ages three to 19 to look at the world around them. Um, this can be a problem as small as trying to get out of bed in the morning to a worldwide problem like we are experiencing right now and see if you can design an invention to solve it. Uh, we provide opportunities for you to meet and interview engineering professions, professionals online, just like we are doing today, to inspire you to think of ideas and start designing some inventions of your own. To help you do this, we've got lots of available resources as well on our website, www.leadersaward.com. So after our interview today, make sure you register for those as well. Our suggestion is that you make this into a weekly challenge. So interviewing different engineering professionals online every week, which we will provide for you. And then looking for a different problem every week that you'd like to solve and design an invention for that. Just before you head, all head back to school, choose your favorite invention that you've come up with over the last few weeks. Take this into schools where they can then send off your entry uh, to us for our engineering professionals to read and grade. Um, so without further ado now, I'll now pass over to Priscilla Johnson, who, as I mentioned before, is an aerospace and engineering student with, with pilot studies at UWE Bristol. Hi, Priscilla. Hiya. Can you hear me? Yeah, brilliant. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. And I'll just make sure your video's started as well. Are you able? There we go. Yep, yeah, fantastic. I can see you there. Hi, Priscilla. Hi. Uh, can you hear me quite good, right? There's no yes, I can. Yeah, I can hear you. That's totally fine. And then just see if you can share your screen now. If ever anyone is having trouble with uh, the sound or the video at all, just let me know in the chat section as well. Yeah, is that that's perfect. Yeah, I can see that now, Priscilla. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, so is, is it okay for me to start? Um, yes, off you go, Priscilla. That's perfect. Okay, yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Priscilla. I am currently um, towards the end of my journey at university. So I've, I did five years um, at UWE Bristol um, with an integrated master's. Um, so I did three years of bachelor's, one year of placement, and then finish, is now finishing with a master's as well. So today, I just want to quickly run through you, um, to run uh, through you what I've done at university, uh, whether it's studies, not studies, and also what I did at placement, and also another extra cool thing that I did as well. Uh, so if we if we move straight on to it, no, nope. is that right? Nope. Yeah, that's worked. That's it. Seemed to go into it then, Priscilla. That seemed to be okay. Okay, yeah, that should be fine. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, a quick uh, intro to my background. So um, I was born in India, uh, but I did. I have lived in Saudi Arabia for many years. And also I went back home in India to live for one year as well. And then uh, I came to the UK uh, back in 2006. And I've been here. I've done my most of my secondary school and my university kind of studies here in the UK. Uh, I went to a school. Um, so I live in a place called High Wycombe. It's just near Reading. And um, I went to school here and I, uh, I managed to get um, four GCSEs, seven A stars and six A's. And I, I also got, um, I did, I got three A2 levels of so maths, chem chemistry and physics. And I also did a AS um, engineering. Um, so for in my school, I was the first girl to take um, engineering as a subject in sixth form. So I was pretty, um, I was pretty happy with myself, even though it wasn't a very high grade. Um, I was happy that I was my, I managed to get through one year of engineering at school as the first girl. Uh, so yeah, so that's just a bit about me. Um, and before I go into kind of like the academic side of university, I want to show you what we do um, at university when, when it's not just all about studies, but um, university really pushes you to try and do things outside of studies because that's where you can get a lot of the skills that you probably won't get when you are studying. And so um, I personally, what I've done is I've done, I'm a student ambassador for the university. So that means I represent the university at different events. So whether it's open days or maybe going to schools and coming and talking to um, future, future engineers, future university students and so on. 
Um, I've taken part in a lot of um, challenges. Uh, so a key one is something called the IMEKI UAS challenge. So it's where um, it's done by a very professional body. And um, what they what you have to do is you have to create a um, kind of like an aut um, autonomous drone and um, it has to uh, pick up a package it has to drop it off at a certain point and then it has to come back all done through automation so I did that actually my first year I was um, uh, I was I was quite nervous because in, in my team they were all um, final year students uh, but they were so kind enough to have me on uh, to kind of help them out uh, with their projects so I helped out with making the drone and also other things that um, I've done is um, I, I've got the wonderful opportunity to um, go and see the Concorde for its 50th anniversary at Aerospace Bristol. So if any of you um, are not maybe based in Bristol or if you ever if you ever come by Bristol, I always um, I recommend um, visiting Aerospace Bristol. So that's where the Concorde is based and it's very very nice view, uh, nice sight to see. So yeah, um, so yeah, so extracurricular activities, there are kind of different clubs and societies that you can join. And yeah, they always push for us to kind of um, join any society and to try and like take part and not just think all about studies. You need to have skills outside of um, what you study as well. So yeah. So let's move on to kind of what do future engineers at do? So some of you may have a, maybe a bit of an idea of what an engineer might do at university. So not in a workplace, um, but a university, but um, it's a very standard routine. So we attend lectures, uh, we have to go to tutorials. So they're like mini workshops uh, where we either do like uh, problems and we go through activities or we have to make something, uh, we have to try and test some things. Um, and then we have either individual study or group study. So this is our standard routine every, regardless of whatever year you're in. And um, we have something called modules. So where um, in school you may have kind of, um, so you, you, you do a certain uh, subject for like whole year, we do modules where it's one topic that you study for maybe, uh, maybe one term or, or something that you study for um, three, uh, three terms and so on. And as you as you go more um, with your study, um, you will have more, you, you will have like more number of modules or you will have less number of modules. And um, we also um, engineers, they have a bit of coursework and exam. So we don't always have just exams. We have things called coursework where you have to maybe try and um, try and make a practical thing using the stuff that you learned in your lectures. So one, um, one thing that I did in my first year is if you look at this picture where we had to design, um, so they gave us this foam cutout and we have to then decide um, how long um, this certain wing has to be. And as a team, we then decided um, what the length is. We decided the, uh, the design, as you can see, it's a very flame, uh, kind of flaming wings, um, which is very contradictory because we don't want to do, we don't want an aircraft wing on fire as it's flying. But um, 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 so, uh, and so we have, um, so we did that. And uh, another challenge that were to this um, particular coursework was that we had to determine how much weight it can carry while it was flying. And so we, we predicted, so we made a prediction and then towards the end of term, we went out to a field and um, uh, our lecturer, he decided to put this on an aircraft and then he, uh, and it flew and we just measured how long it flew and whether it could carry the weight that we predicted. And, um, and lucky, lucky for us, it actually managed to carry more than what we predicted. So we were very happy with um, our predictions and our wings. Um, so yeah, so that's one of the coursework that you do. Um, and also um, future engineers at university, it's not just like you don't just you don't just study just with aerospace engineers. You study with mechanical. You study with so many different types of engineers, and this is really good because it opens your eyes up to all the other types of engineering. So you can kind of explore and see maybe this area is, area of engineering is better for me, and this area maybe not so much. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So this is what what a few engineers do at UWE Bristol. Um, we have a flight simulator, so we can use the facilities um, as much, but like as safely as we can. Um, so yeah. 
And so moving on to kind of what does aerospace engineers in particular do at university? So um, we have three main categories of um, um, within aerospace. And so the first one is design. So it's um, times like this where you have, where you have to you know, kind of design the internal things within an aircraft. And you have to show this not as a physical part, but as something that you design on a computer. So um, if you, so if this is something that you're interested in, if you, if you like to draw, uh, if you like to design um, kind of parts and objects on computer, if you're good with something called CAD, so that's called a computer aided uh, design, if you're good with um, systems like that, then this is probably something that you that you can go towards. So this is all looking all um, this is like a really good way. Rather than spending loads and loads of amount of money trying to build a plane, you can actually build a plane through a des through design. Then see if it's if it can actually be be made in real life. Okay. So another part of design that we look at is something called is something like this, where we look at um, so if the aircraft was made. Um, what, how would the aircraft behave if, um, if, um, or how the aircraft would behave when air flows over it? So you, as you can see, all these yellow and um, and red and blue, all these different kind of um, colors, they're showing us how each air particle is affecting the aircraft. Yeah. So how the airflow is going, uh, whether it's going smoothly or whether it's going pretty rough um, uh, with the aircraft. So if you look at the back, you can see that it's not a very smooth line as we want it to be whereas if we as it goes over the wing so you can see how it changes but then it starts to go smoother again so yeah so this is another part of design that you try and kind of uh, try and predict how um, how the air will behave when you actually fly this aircraft so that's one part of um, uh, of aerospace that engineers can specialize in Another part is systems. So this is a view that most of you, uh, if not every one of us um, should uh, are familiar with. Um, if you ever get a chance to actually see this view in an aircraft, I highly recommend it. Um, so this is um, so this is all about um, the systems behind actually running the aircraft, okay? So this is one of the main systems. You have the cockpit. So you have all these different instruments that help the aircraft run smoothly safely and um, effectively okay and so um, the aerospace engineers what they do for this one is um, they have to kind of look into how everything talks to each other that's the main element of systems is that how does how does for example the controls talk to the talk to the talk to the system that looks into the weather or how each of the instruments are talking to each other and so yeah so that that's another part that if you are interested in you can go towards you can specialize in that then another part of systems is uh, things like lighting or things like um, or things like the entertainment systems that you get to watch movies and um, that, that controls the temperature that controls all the different systems inside an aircraft so not 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 in that we're not we're not now in the cockpit but now we're where the passengers sit so we're now looking at the systems that control um, entertainment the temperature the lighting so the aerospace engineers they deal they have have to they have to come up with systems that do all these things without um, uh, without being a danger um, to the aircraft or without causing any problems so that's another big part of what an aerospace engineer does so you can you can specialize in um, systems and then the final kind of um, the part of aerospace engineer is manufacturing. So we've got three main areas, manufacturing, and this is what I am um, specialized in. Um, so manufacturing, as you can see in this picture, an aircraft, building an aircraft is not as easy or is not as, um, it's not as, yeah, it's not as simple as building maybe a car or something smaller. So if you look in this picture, there are so many different um, parts and people um, involved in building an aircraft and um, and each of these parts so you can maybe build an, uh, you can maybe build a car within a day but an aircraft in order to build it you have it has to go through um, it's, it usually takes years to build just one aircraft or years or months to build one aircraft so as you can see uh, the manufacturing in terms of aerospace engineers they look at how can we build a, an aircraft in, in the most cost effective way so we want to try and save money 
money, but we want it to we want it to be made in a way that um, it won't cause any harm or it won't break down. So that's that, that's a huge part of um, of manufacturing and also um, using a process that is actually kind of smart that doesn't um, that that you that won't like go away in like a couple of years that you that it will stick around for a while. So yeah, so there are many different elements involved in making an aircraft. Uh, you've got the process, you've got the machines. Yeah, so you have to decide, do you want this aircraft to be built by humans? You want it to be built by um, automated maybe machines or do you want a bit of both? So that's all involved in this journey. And then another part of manufacturing is what kind of material do you want to build your aircraft out of? Yeah, do you want to use, so currently we are, um, or a lot of the um, aircraft is now moving into being built out of something called composites. Okay, so these are these are there. We can call them a smarter material because they can um, they can give us strength in certain um, directions, and then they can give us flexibility in the other directions. So um, companies are looking into um, involving these uh, materials into aircraft into aircraft parts and so yeah, as an aerospace engineer who specializes in manufacturing you have to decide which material your your wing is going to be made of yeah which material your your blades are going to be made out of and um yeah and if there is any new material out there how will it benefit the aircraft is it going to be a good benefit a bad benefit then um how long is that material going to last before you need to replace it yeah is it going to is it going to be easy to replace it quite difficult to ma uh, maintain it so these are all the different kind of elements within an aerospace engineer yeah? so uh, don't ever think that being an aerospace engineer is just about maybe the design just about looking at the systems or manufacturing um we you when you go to university the good thing is you get to you get to really um uh, get a flavor of what each of the three um areas do and then um yeah, and then you can kind of decide um i think my strength is more manufacturing so i'm going to specialize in that or i think my strength is more from the space and then you can do that so yeah so university gives you a chance for you to really uh, choose a certain area that you really like and um, you can you can start working towards that area so moving on to what I am uh, what I've been doing for the past uh, two years. So at university, when you come towards your final year, you have to do one year uh, worth of your own individual project. So you have to look into and research into a project that you're very, um, you're, that you want to do and that you want to find out that would help not just university, but that would help the industry as well. Um, so I have, um, so I've done two years of this because um, I did my first year of my uh, end of my bachelor's and then the second for my master's um, and so I was looking into something called morphing okay so we know that morphing is when is um, when something goes from one position to, an, to another smoothly okay so that's that's what morphing is and the greatest example of morphing we can see is through birds yeah so we can see a bird that can go from this stage all the way to this position it can go so smoothly using its feathers and we want to try and kind of use that in aircraft because um, the reason why the bird goes through goes to this position is that it helps um, helps it to gain um, better speed it can fly, fly a lot more faster uh, but then it doesn't have to use a lot more energy to fly um, when it's going through this so um, this is the peregrine falcon which is one of the fastest flyers and it can dive very very, very fast just in this moment but then um, once it's done it then goes back to this shape so we want to try and see if we can change the aircraft from maybe something that's um, that, that we can change the shape of the aircraft so that it can fly either faster or better and so then we can get to places quicker or we can try and save save some money on fuel and so yeah so these are the three different um, areas in which a bird changes its shapes so it it can fold or it can expand it can twist um, or it can flex or extend as well okay and if we look into current aircraft there are there are a couple of things in place that that helps aircrafts to kind of change its shape or it helps it to gain a bit more speed or slow itself down and um, the most uh, familiar one that uh, we all see is flaps so you may see at the end of the wing 
thing, uh, there is this little tiny bit that pokes out and that, that kind of goes up and down like this. So that, um, uh, that helps when we want to lower the speed, we usually put the flaps down, we put it down and so the, air, um, the aircraft loses some of its speed. And then when we want to try and fly faster, we make sure that it's straight. So that's, a, that's something that's already been used in aircraft, but also we've got our landing gear, so retractable landing gear. So obviously when, we were, when we're flying, when we're cruising, we don't want big wheels to stick out of the aircraft. So what we do is we, uh, they invented retractable landing gear, so that helps the aircraft maintain, maintain a better shape as it's flying, okay? So these are currently being used and these all involve changing the actual shape of the aircraft. But as I was more interested in kind of the material side, kind of the manufacturing, I was looking into, can we make, um, or can we make a morphing material? So a material that changes shape or that maybe gives us a bit of flexibility so that it can change shape. Okay, so that kind of leads on to my project. So my first kind of um, part of my project was to create um, this skin. Uh, and so I use something called carbon fiber. So it's the black kind of net material that you see here. And actually this material uh, comes quite close together, but um, I had to, uh, in order to kind of make sure that things can go through, um, I had to kind of uh, take out every other strand using tweezers. So that was a good kind of half an hour spent and I would and, and I would do like maybe uh, five or six samples so that was a lot of hours just trying to take out each strand using tweezers yeah so sometimes we have to use even the most simplest tools to to really help us with our projects uh, and so um, so one part of my material was carbon fiber and the next part is silicon yeah so these are two everyday materials that you would use that you would see um, maybe not carbon fiber um, at home but silicon definitely your you can see it in everyday things and so I decided I'm going to use those two because carbon fiber will give me the strength that I want and then silicon will give me the flexibility will give me the stretch and uh, that I wanted as well okay uh, so what I would do is I would get the carbon fiber ready, then I would um, get the silicon ready. Now the silicon had, uh, because it's because it's liquid, uh, we have, there's, there's always an issue in the fact um, that little particles or little bubbles can get inside the liquids as you're mixing it. Uh, and we don't really want that when we're trying to make something because that means uh, the material won't behave like we really want it to. And so what we have to do is we have to put it inside something called a, a vacuum changer. So that's this big gray um, machine that you see over here. And so what this, uh, what this uh, machine does is when you put your sample inside it, it completely seals off. So it takes out all the air um, in, uh, in this big tube. And then by taking out all the air, it is then making sure that all the bubbles are removed and it's mixed well as well. So sometimes as humans or as people, we may make errors. So we, we, we won't, we won't probably mix it together quite well. So this just kind of double checks it for us and gives it in a better one. So yeah, so you put the silicon through that and then, um, then you put your first layer of carbon fiber, your first layer of this material, then you put the silicon on top and then you spread it out. Um, so this, is, this was a very therapeutic, so a bit of calming uh, thing to do. So you, uh, you stretch it out, uh, you spread the silicon and then you put your next layer and then you finish off with your final layer of silicon, okay? And so we, um, I use plates because they were already pre-made um, in the university and also you need a set design or you need a set um, length when you're trying to test it later on. So yeah, so um, and then uh, because we're trying to get these two materials to stick together quite well, um, what I decided is maybe to put um, to use some weights to put on top of this uh, of these plates to try and really push the carbon and the silicon to come together okay uh, because if they weren't together and if there was any gaps in between then it wouldn't it wouldn't stretch as well or there would be it would tear maybe once the first time you give it a pull it might just go apart and we don't really want that uh, so uh, I put it away and then I had to take it out after um, after waiting a day because that's how long the silicon um, uh, that that's how long it took for the silicon to cure. 
and um, and so um, a big part of materials or a big part of manufacturing is you always need to test what you make yeah that's a that's a huge part of what uh, materials and manufacturing is so i decided to uh, test my material to see how how much strength it can really take so how much i can really stretch it before it starts to uh, to fall apart and this is something that you call a tensile testing okay so this is where a machine grips um a sample and it literally starts to pull it apart as, and then it just keeps pulling until the sample just breaks and then we'll be able to tell how much um, strength uh, so, uh, this sample or this material can really take yeah uh, so yeah so this is the this is a quick example of my material so as you can see um if I bring it closer, you can see that it's crisscrossed. So this is uh, the particular direction I went with. Uh, the good thing about carbon fiber is you can try and uh, put it in different directions. I went with this one because then if I put it in this direction, I can then stretch it that way. So it's flexible in this direction. But then if I try and stretch it sideways, there's no give. Yeah. So it's strong if you're trying to stretch it uh, when you uh, in the side in the diagonal directions but when you're trying to stretch it in the vertical which is what we need when a ring is moving up and down it's quite flexible yeah so that's why I went for this um, direction and so yeah I managed to get kind of the um, uh, how strong a material was and then so this was my first part um, that I did for a year and then the second part was when I tried to see if I can actually test it if I can actually show this on a moving device okay so the moving device I used uh, you can see it in a picture here so this was um, previously created by another student at the university um, and um, and the university is quite uh, is very big on trying to um, share and trying to work with others in order to create a better solution. Um, so uh, the student said I could use his device. And so what this device would do is it would move up and down. So it, it had a flap at the back that would move um, up and down and it gave a bit of a morphing or a moving um, element. And so I decided I'm going to try and attach my material um, to the top and see how well it moves, um, see if it can move back and forth and what the good things and bad things were, yeah? So my first kind of issue was um, I had to uh, find a way in order to make sure, because even though this can stretch, it needs a bit of a extra strength there to make it stretch. So I had to work around with a lot of different weights um, that you would find uh, like the normal kind of uh, uh, weights. And then I tried to attach them to the end to see um, if they would work, if they would give me the stretch I would need while it's moving up and down. Uh, and then, uh, so if we, so in this video, you can see how uh, this, um, how this, um, device is moving up and down so the first part yeah so um it's now it's straight and see how it goes further down so that was the first part and my material had to had to stretch at this position and then it went it now goes upwards and so my material had to keep its position at that um, moment as well and then obviously have to come back to the middle so this was kind of like the element of how it would work on this moving device. And so um, once again, the next part of, um, of an engineer's design process is you have to test whatever. So whatever you predict, whatever you want to try, you always have to test your idea. And so I decided to test mine in something called a wind tunnel. Um, so for, for those who don't know what a wind tunnel is, so wind tunnel is a big um, kind of a facility. It was, it's, in our university, it's two rooms where um, you can uh, you can get like you can kind of mimic um, wind um, blowing in a certain direction. So you can you can mimic the air flowing over certain things. Okay, and so I decided to put my um, uh, to put my material on this uh, moving device and see how would, how would it would behave when the air was flowing over it at certain so when it was facing up when it was facing down at different angles as well so we can see it in the next video so yeah so this is so you've as you can see in the background you can see the the little red 
things uh, moving. So that, that shows us that the wind tunnel is on. And so the air is going and then you can move the uh, this board to different positions and then you can test how well your air um, how well or you can test the results of um, of when it measures uh, how much lift so how much uh, force it gets from the upper and the lower directions and so that's what um, we use to try and plot a graph and see if it's good or bad so yeah so this is what a wind tunnel basically looks it's very loud but it's a very useful uh, piece of equipment uh, so yeah so that that's kind of uh, my main kind of my project and uh, I, I was looking into uh, oh I'll, actually out of the testing uh, I managed to find out that my material did actually very uh, did, did behave very well compared to other uh, materials so I I tested it with uh, with another material that looks like this so it's got a bit of stretch so I tested it with this and with like a bandage material to try and get a comparison and um, on that moving device my material behaved a lot better so it gave, it gave me a lot more of the stretch but then a lot more of the strength that the other two materials didn't get so um, so yeah so it was a it was a great success and um, if I was to carry on this project forward um, what I would do is um, there there are there are many other kind of moving devices at the university so um, my plan is to kind of uh, put this material onto the other devices and see if I can maybe get a better way of making it um, stretch and come um, and st uh, stretch and com compress without having extra additional weight okay so um, uh, outside from my university life, the two other things that I got to do as part of my degree is my first uh, thing is I got my private pilot license. So I have a big desire to be a pilot. Uh, that's my dream one day. And so as part of our degree, uh, we managed to uh, we managed to go over to the US. Um, there's a school in which our university partners with and we managed to get uh, to uh, get our private pilot license over uh, 10 weeks. And I did that. I did this between my second and third year, so in the summer holidays during that time. Um, so it was a really, really um, kind of fun but nerve-wracking experience for me. So this picture is uh, is the one that I took at the end of my first solo flight. So you have to fly by yourself, and the first time that you did, oh, I was very nervous, very scared. But luckily, no major accidents. I managed to land there and take off very well so that was uh, that was a plus and um and this is like so this is the view that you would see outside the aircraft it was a very nice place and so you could see blue skies and um blue waters um and then this is just a bit uh, a short video of me flying um so obviously you you don't uh you don't take a uh, you don't take any videos by yourself you so I had my instructor and so he offered to take a video so yeah so um, I flew in a manual um, aircraft control so all this I had to kind of learn and understand what each of these controls did and um, obviously there are aircrafts now who, which have a lot of these as automated um, or in like electronic screens um, but I decided to learn in a uh, in a very manual cockpit and yeah, so it was it was nerve wracking but exciting. Um, and then also um, another good thing for about this school is the fact that they had loads of different kinds of airplanes. And uh, one of the airplanes that they had was um, could do water landings, so it could take off and land in water. And so towards the end, as a reward, um, we we all or well, I managed to have a go at flying one of these so uh, with an instructor so yeah so my future options or my future plan is to um, carry on with my training and then one day um, hopefully be an airline pilot and maybe see you guys in the air or as you are uh, as you're traveling to your wonderful holidays uh, so another thing that I did as part of my degree is I did a placement so a placement is when you spend one year working at a company um, or it can be a three month or a six month so it's just a time that you spend um, working uh, with a company just to try and get some experience of what it would be like to actually um, uh, be in a real uh, kind of working environment and so I did mine at Jaguar Land Rover 
um, in Birmingham, and uh, we uh, and I managed to see. Well, I was working with a lot of Range Rovers, um, a lot of um, F paces, so very very nice luxury cars. But as part of my degree, I worked in um, the plant launch department. So what our department did is we made sure that um, when a new car was being built, it was built to like the best. Uh, standards and it was built to the best kind of ability and also um, we made sure that if there was an issue that people found when they were trying to make the car um, what you know, that it was told perfectly or it was told clearly to the engineering teams who would then try and make adjustments to make sure that that car was being built a lot better so I had to go through um, a lot of information um, of all the associates of all the employees um, writing down each of the faults that they would see and then I had to kind of go through that put it in a very clear way so that engineering so that we could take it to engineering and say look this is not working out so we need you to try and um, help us out try and uh, make this process a lot better okay and also another um, good thing uh, another great thing that I did with them is with the local school we um, did an engineering project where uh, we would take a project from Jaguar Land Rover and then we would um, help these sixth form students um, kind of come up with a solution to that project and this is uh, this is something that they made so this is for a um, the arch of a wheel so down here uh, we wanted to try and make this part a bit more smoother so that air can flow better and so they managed to get this working um, in an automated process so yeah so this was a this is a great opportunity for me to really understand um where like what you study at university or what you study at school trying trying to put that in a very useful and a very kind of practical way that's what placement is for you um so yeah so if you ever get a chance to do maybe work experience or placement um definitely have a go for that it's a very useful time um but other than that um thank you so much for uh listening to me and um yeah um i hope you i hope you understand just a bit of what we do at university all the different things that we look at so yeah i just want to say thank you uh, priscilla for your presentation there it's so so interesting to hear about and i think the participants have really found it interesting as been, there's been so many questions that have actually come in wow. already so we'll try and get to those um now if that's okay i'll just read them out for you priscilla if that's okay yeah that's fine so the first one is from Tavindu. Uh, what is your favorite aircraft oh uh i think it will have to be airbus a380 it's um it's a it's it's one of the newer ones and it's got um i think i believe it's the double decker ones it's it's got a very nice interior and i think that's one of my favorite ones uh Tavindu is also asking what's your favorite subject as well well what was your favorite subject at school i think Oh, at school, uh, I must say my favorite subject was um, nothing related to engineering, but it was actually art. I really enjoyed art quite well, but um, I liked maths as well. Maths was another favorite of mine at school. Ray is asking, uh, what triggered your mind to become an engineer? Or did you just know um, from one moment that just flicked into a switch in your mind that you wanted to become an engineer? Um well there wasn't like that one moment that, that's such a great question uh i've never been asked that question uh so yeah there wasn't that one moment i've i'm always someone that really likes to get practical and do something with my kind of hands just get in there and do it and um and i really liked maths as well so then um, i liked maths chemistry so all these kind of science and uh, sciencey subjects so i realized that engineering was a great area where I could kind of use these skills and these subjects that I really love for to try and like make a kind of like a working element to try and really get my hands dirty so yeah um I there wasn't that one moment but as I kind of was going through school I got into a and um, I, I got an, I took part a lot of like projects and after school um clubs and so when when we did a lot of practical things I really enjoyed them so yeah that was my kind of moment going into um, engineering. Uh, Brian is asking, what has been your favorite part of your course so far? My favorite part, uh, uh, they've been they've been quite a lot. Um, okay, I think my favorite part so far has been. Um, so we have a flight simulator, so it kind of um, 
a flight simulator mimics um, an aircraft so you can get inside and you can see uh, you can literally fly an aircraft and so I for the last couple of months I've been giving kind of sessions and tutorials and that was a really good thing because I really enjoyed the fact that um, I could show other people my passion of flying through a flight simulator and it was pretty cool to kind of be behind the controls so yeah that was probably the best part of my course so far. We've all got a question here. So what did you prefer, primary school or secondary school when you were growing up? Oh, uh, I must say I enjoyed primary school more than secondary school. <laughs> um, I don't know why. I think it was just, it was a lot more simpler in primary school. Secondary school, secondary school, school was good. Um, but yeah, primary school was a lot more fun at that time. Uh, Frey is asking, did you have a, a fallback plan? Uh, so if... Uh, was it not that you would want to be? So if you didn't have engineering, did you have a fallback plan? Uh, so if I didn't go into engineering, actually my fallback plan was to go into teaching um, as I really loved, like I love sharing my knowledge with others. So teaching was another great part. And the coolest thing about engineering or at a, about our courses, there's actually one um, particular module or, or a subject in which we actually go into primary schools and maybe and, and give a lesson for the day. So that was a really good way where I could experience a bit of my fallback plan as well. So yeah. Uh, Tavindu is also asking, uh, how long do you think it takes to construct the wing of an A380? Ooh, uh, uh, that is definitely a more than six months. That is definitely a more than six months job. Oh, uh, another good question here. So uh, will you get to design a rocket ship at any point? Uh, see, I, I don't, me personally, I don't think, no, I would not be because um, that's that's a very kind of, if you're, if you're interested in space, then yes, we have like projects like that. But um, as I, 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 I wasn't really interested into space, so I probably won't be able to, but that's definitely a cool idea that I would love to do one day, but not, yeah. Uh, Frey is also asking, do you have any siblings? If so, what do they think of your dream to become an engineer? Uh, so um, I do ha I have a younger brother and he has just started university and he is um, st he's studying automotive engineering so engineering to do with cars so both of us are very much um, interested in engineering and trying to get practical uh, which is a bit of a sad thing for a mom because um, she she's in the medical field so she doesn't really have anyone to go in, going down that field but yeah so both of us are kind of interested in the engineering field. So another one from Tavindu, uh, how would you, how would pilots know if a fuel tank is ruptured? Do you know that, Priscilla? Yeah, so um, so a big part uh, or a big indicator is you would, um, so as a, if you go back to, or if you think, um, go back to that image of the, co of the cockpit, so there will be specific instruments that tells you um, information about your fuel. And so then if you know that a fuel tank is, um, is, is ruptured or is broken, uh, what um, it will it will then start to drain, and it, it's very similar to like um, understanding the fuel on like your car, where you know that it, when it gets to empty, you need to do something. So yeah, so we're on, on an aircraft, pilots always have to maintain. They always have to watch that dial that tells us how much fuel. And if you know that it's dropping too fast, we know that then there's there's an issue. So yeah, that's where the controls really kick in and help us to understand how the aircraft is flying. So we've got one here. So uh, what are the subjects or degrees do you need to be uh, become an engineer? So I think what kind of qualifications do you need? Yeah, so for this one, um, a main thing that you would need to do is um, maths. Maths is a, is a big part of engineering um, that you would use from day one. So if you, could, if you have a really good understanding of maths, if you enjoy maths, then definitely engineering. But then even if you don't enjoy maths, like don't let that put put you off because if you enjoy maybe designing or understanding or making things engineering still for you um, but a lot of the university ask for maths and if you do struggle with maths um, good thing about universities they offer you a lot of support so they, uh, they there are like extra sessions extra kind of um, teaching staff who can help you if you are struggling with maths so, but yeah maths is a very key element of engineering maths and physics um, but um, yeah maths is the bigger one Kevin's just asking, have you ever thought about a different type of engineering like electrical engineering? Uh, 
that's that's actually a good question so when i went um when i was um, doing my placement at jaguar um a lot of the um a lot of the people within my department they had a previous um, background in electrical engineering and why so i had to kind of shadow them and when i was partnered with them and working a lot of uh, the electrical side i really enjoyed um the things that i learned from the electrical engineers um so yeah that that definitely made me like um, I had never con considered electrical engineering before, but that gave me a good appreciation for what electrical engineering could be. Yeah, so yeah, that's a that would be a good one. Yeah. Um, similar to kind of what you were on about about um, the grades that you get from school. Uh, Frey is saying, what grades should I aim for in high school? In high school, uh, so well, I'm guessing that would be GCSEs, right? Or yes. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. So in GCSEs. Um, I would say try and get it as high as you can. Um, um, GCSEs are there to help you when you go to sex form. So as long as you can meet whatever grade your sixth form is asking you for maths, um, if you can get those grades, then yeah, that would be good. But C and above. If you can get Bs and As and A stars, then that would be good as well. I think they have a numbering system now as well. Which I'm yes, I think it's slightly different now. Yeah, um, with, so. with, the, with the numbering, I think is yeah. yeah, I think you're right there. Like, uh, eight and nine or seven yes yeah so yeah it's all di all different from when we were <laughs> at school yeah, I think. At school, yeah so <laughs> as i said if you can get higher than i think it's the six or a seven then you should be you should be good yeah um so vindu looking who's also asking uh do you know how long it takes to construct an engine for an airplane Ooh, an engine um i think the engine would probably be three four months so not as it wouldn't take as much time as building um the wing but um yeah just maybe three four months that's my guess for that um i'm just gonna ask you a little bit of a question around kind of away from engineering is there anything outside of engineering that you enjoy to do um outside yeah outside just to kind of de-stress or anything yeah so um, so one of the big things i do is i'm a huge fan of i'm a big reader so i read a lot of books so that's another thing that i do and i also love taking photographs so i'm a I try and travel a lot of to, to a lot of different places, um, whether it's at home or into a new place and try and take um, try and discover um, my surroundings through photography. So, yeah. I think they're quite creative um, interests as well. I think does yeah. that help does that help you with the creative process when engineering? It does. It really does. Like, as I said, I took um, I took art in in GCSE and um, I still I still at spare times I still kind of draw I still kind of get creative and that really helps when you're trying to solve a problem because in it, it just it just makes sure that you're not exactly going for one route of giving a solution you're actually considering others you're you're brainstorming ideas you can think of different ones and um, and a lot of employers they like um they like um, their graduates or their students to have a creative element because you can think of of like many different solutions rather than just one solution. I think that's a really good point you made there about problem solving because that's what we're asking the children to do is think about lots of problems that they can solve and make inventions from that. Is it really important to draw your designs? Do you think when you're inventing? yeah that's a that's a that's a that's that's a big part like it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be very perfect or very like uh, precise but even if even if yeah, a rough drawing is always good because um like we can we can imagine something in our mind but then try and get in, getting into paper that's how we're going to communicate it that's how we're going to share it with the people around us so if it doesn't work out on paper um then that's when you realize oh maybe i need to think differently i need to maybe come up with a different design that even works in my mind and also on paper i think as well um you were on about different materials that you use um as well do you think that's really important to think about all those different materials that you can use and the best material for exactly. inventions yeah definitely because um especially we're now looking into trying to keep the planet safe and trying to save the planet and so we want to try and use materials that won't cause any harm to not just the planet but to humans because there are some materials out there that when it's going through certain uh, certain phases or certain parts it can actually be a danger to to people in like the air that we breathe um or in the water that we drink so yeah thinking about the different types of materials is very important because um 
so someone can invent a material that actually can be a solution to a lot of problems so yeah don't always stick to like the standard material try and think outside of the box try and maybe think oh can this material be used for this um, purpose or not so we've got another one here from Tavindu. so what happens if a landing gear fails at all so if a landing gear fails, then that's a very, very big uh, risk because obviously you need to land. So that's when um, pilots have, uh, they have like, a, you could call it a handbook um, of processes that they need to kind of um, remind themselves of that they need to remember. And in, the, in that handbook, it goes through all the different scenarios and it tells you what you need to do. Um, as you're going through um, each kind of failure or each um, kind of issue. So yeah, so pilots would turn to this handbook. If there's nothing in there, that's when they would talk to the air traffic control and they will try and maybe um, help you to land in a different um, method or in a different way or safely. So yeah. Um, we've got one from Frey. I think you might have touched on this already, but what were your favorite subjects in school? In school, um, so art for one, and then I liked chemistry and maths. So these were the favorite subjects at school. Um, another one from Kevin. So what are your thoughts on helicopters and how they're made? Um, helicopter, I, I, I really like, I love the topic of helicopters, but for me, I don't really have a passion for helicopters. Like they're amazing in what they do and it'd be good if one day we can merge. So there are concepts now of where we can try and merge a helicopter and a plane together. So try and get it to take off vertically, but then fly in that direction, um, in the uh, kind of the, same direction so there are plans being made too but i'm not very passionate about, about helicopters but they're definitely very cool and they're they're a lot more complicated than your standard um aircraft so yeah if you're interested in um those please do kind of pursue that so tavindu and Lincoln is also asking um are, are all cockpit cockpit doors bulletproof Ooh, oh oh i do you know uh, I'm, I'm not sure about that actually I've never been <laughs> I've never been asked that question uh, that's a tough one <laughs> that is actually I think that might take a bit more of a research but I'm not sure about that I'm sorry I can't give you an answer for that one um, I'm just going to touch on our kind of leaders award competition that we run um, yeah. we, we ask the students to uh, think of a problem and kind of design an invention for that problem mm -hmm. is there any kind of I'm going to kind of put you on the spot a little bit Priscilla um, it is, is there any ideas that you can think of now? And I can, I'll give you a bit of time if you want to answer some of the questions, but if in the meantime, if you want to have a think about an invention that you think would be good or even something that could help you in your job at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Come, do you want me I'm to not... ask a few more questions and then yes, you can have a come yeah, back to that so one? Can, yes. Yeah. Um, so oh, Frey's asking, obviously you said you did different things like reading and things that's, uh, um, in, in your own time. Did you ever sing, uh, Frey's asking in school or anything like that? Yeah, so um, I well, I I don't sing at school, but I sing at church and I play the keyboard. So I'm I like to kind of um, de-stress using kind of musical um, skills and talents that I have. But um, at school, I used I, I was part of the dance team, so we we did that. So yeah, um, I hope that answered that question. That's yeah, that's another kind of creative, yeah. I think, um, interest of yours as well. Um, yeah. Kevin's also asking, uh, how do you save a plane if it's stalling? If you're stalling, um, so yeah, so there. Um, so first step, we always refer to that handbook that a pilot has. So um, they obviously we have to learn a lot of this by heart. Um, but then there are certain procedures that you would have to go through. So you can land an aircraft. Um, without the engine in a worst case scenario but then if it goes to install you want to try and bring it back to a level so if it was maybe going down you would try and pull back and try and make it level again um, as I said there are other kind of procedures in that book that will help you that will guide you to that process but if it's a very worst case scenario then that's where you would have to talk to like people within the air traffic control people on the radio to try and see if there's any other answers on how to um, how to land the aircraft obviously we never want this kind of situation to ever take place but um, this is something that um, as part of training um, uh, the instructors would literally put us into a stall and they would um, uh, and they would see or, or we would have to then do the stuff that we would um, do if we were to go into a stall what are the different procedures this is part of our final exam um, and so we have to do things without losing 
any altitude without losing any speed. Um, you have to do it very precisely because if one wrong thing, then it could be very fatal. Um, Tavinia is also asking, can turbulence crash a plane? Yeah, that's um, because you've got two different types of turbulence and um, yeah, turbulence can uh, crash a plane. And Brian is asking, in the future, do you want your morphing skin to be used on aircraft to help improve them? Um, I I would yes that is uh, that is actually that would be a very good kind of way it's especially the fact that um, a lot of the companies now they're looking into carbon fiber and so they're looking into putting this material on aircraft so this would be a great kind of solution and so yeah it would be amazing if if it was used in an aircraft in the future. And another one from Brian is so are there any developments that are being made to try and make planes more eco eco friendly and yeah. do you have any ideas that would make planes more eco friendly this could be maybe your idea for the leaders award uh, so um, so currently there are um, things like solar powered aircraft um, then like hydrogen powered aircraft so there are um, aircraft that people are building that maybe run of biofuels um, uh, so they're looking into alternative and sort of fuels in terms of um, what powers the aircraft um, uh, nothing is exactly kind of um, in a very final stage yet. So everyone's still designing, everyone's still testing their concepts. There isn't one aircraft at the moment that can fully kind of work on an eco-friendly way, but they are, they are slowly, they're trying to uh, make it better. So trying to use um, a lot, uh, like less, uh, more um, eco-friendly fuel. Uh, and so this is where morphing comes in. So if you can move the aircraft to a certain position, maybe that can save on your travel time, which can then save on how much fuel you consume or how much fuel you use. Um, but um, if I was to, if I was to kind of go for it, um, it'd be definitely, yeah, definitely to kind of go down like the trying to use better ways of fuels. So yeah, not, not, not your standard kind of petrol or kerosene, but trying to come with alternative fuels to power your aircraft. I think that's kind of a quite a good theme for the young engineers to think about yeah. as well, um, about eco-friendly, maybe aircrafts around that as well. Um, just to, one kind of question to end on here, Priscilla, is there any advice you could give to the young engineers who are listening today? Yeah. Uh, so I would say uh, try, like, don't, don't give up. That's probably my biggest kind of tip I would love to give you is don't give up. Um, as an engineer, um, especially my five years um, of doing placement and studying at university there are many times where nothing was some, where something won't really work um, if, uh, as you planned and then um, like and then you feel kind of like you, you may feel a bit discouraged or disappointed but that's when you like don't really I like but when you don't give up and you carry on working and you then suddenly find a solution that actually gave you a better result than what you originally planned. So that my number one tip is don't give up, just keep trying. Um, uh, and especially with the Leaders Award, just like try and um, be as creative as you can, try and research into different things, use, uh, use like the most craziest idea, but in the safest way, use the most craziest idea. And, um, uh, and like you know, sometimes you can find the, the most brilliant idea in the craziest um, situation, so yeah. Um, don't give up just keep keep going at it perfect thank you so much um for that priscilla um, i just want to say a big thank you to you um and for those people who have been sending in their questions they have been amazing we've had so many that have come through um today so big thank you to everyone who has been involved today yeah th thank you to everyone I, some of the questions definitely made me think so thank you so much i really enjoyed those Brilliant. And I hope uh, everyone's kind of been inspired to take on the Leaders Award competition from Priscilla today and start designing. So uh, use our resources on our website at leadersaward.com to help you. And please join us for our upcoming uh, interviews next week as, as well. Um, thank you again for everyone joins. I've, I've put a link for our online survey if they could complete that as well. And then we can get some feedback um, through to Priscilla as well about, about the interview today as well. Um, I think we'll end it there. Is that okay, Priscilla? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you so Brilliant. much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Bye.